This episode contains offensive language and sensitive topic discussions. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived entirely to let me spend more time than I'd ever got on the radio with interesting people. And, well, I think it's true every week, but this week's guest is particularly interesting and someone about whom... Well, the audience will be divided. So part of the audience listening will know a lot about you, Hamza Yusuf, and part of the audience will not. And the distinction in those two categories probably runs roughly across the middle of these (laughs) islands, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah, across Hedron's Wall. Uh, How how, how weird is it? Because I'm on a constant quest to improve my understanding of Scottish politics, to... Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I don't think that some Scottish listeners will, will ever forgive me for ignorance displayed in previous years. But, but how conscious are you of 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 living in in two places and one place at the same time? So, look for me, the relationship with the rest of the UK is just an incredibly important one, and will be post independence. I think what's been fascinating is um, Scottish politics and the Scottish Parliament. Since devolution, but I'd argue, obviously, biased as I am, that since the SNP is in, has shown, given Scottish politics, a much greater prominence than it's had before. Alex Salmond, Nicola Sturgeon, and then, of course, uh, myself. And, you know, that can be down to certain issues. So take the issue of Gaza, for example. And I've been pretty vocal on what I think uh, should be happening uh, there. And what's been interesting in the, my last couple of trips to London and, and to the UK uh, outside of London, there's definitely more recognition of me as an individual because of that issue has been so topical and the advent of social media podcasts that people have heard me speaking. So it's fascinating actually before where Scottish politics would be quite self-contained, mm. definitely not the case anymore. It's changing, not always for, for, for good reasons as well, of course. Of course. Making headlines on, on uh, all over the UK is more likely to be a negative story than a positive story for any politician, but it seems particularly acute I think for Scottish voters, because they'll feel that London only notices when things are going badly. Yeah, there can be an element of that. And there can be an element, frankly, of, of not understanding the nuances of Scottish politics from from some uh, here in London. But actually, look, I, I think there's much more of an interest. I come down with some regularity and, you know, I've just done a, a bit of a, a chat with some of our media colleagues and definitely much more of an interest, I think, in what role Scotland has to play in the wider UK politics and political discourse, but actually just in Scottish politics more generally. I wonder how many voters in England are fully clear on what your next electoral challenges are in in the context of the elections to Westminster and uh, as opposed to elections to Holyrood. Yeah, and they definitely present different dynamics. And I think the the voter, uh, if I was a voter in England, I would be banging my head off the proverbial brick wall because what kind of choice have I got? You know, I've got a choice between, you know, a Conservative government, which is absolutely on its way out, you know, is degenerating into complete and utter chaos and ridicule, actually. And you cover this regularly on your on your programme and I listen to the, the folk that phone in and it seems to be an almost universal view of where the Conservatives are. And then you've got a Labour Party who are 20 to 28 points ahead in the polls and just meh. There's no radical, bold, inspiring vision. It's just we're going to manage the decline that the UK is on but just do it a little bit more competently than the other guys. And Liberal Democrats, God knows what they stand for other than kind of silly photo ops and stunts after a by-election victory. I think the Greens, but you know, they're not going to, 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 I think, increase their presence significantly. So I think if you're in England, you're thinking, what on earth? There's a big opportunity for Scotland and the SNP to go, well, actually, there's an alternative. I, I think Ed Davey was sitting in that chair a month ago and, and kissed Armour a couple of years ago, so they'd no doubt disagree slightly with your analysis. But on the sure. on the Labour question, there's, there's, a, there's a problem there, isn't there? Because, you know, let's say your analysis is right, the, the lack of pizzazz, you're not the first to point it out, but why on earth would they be reaching for any different offering for voters if they are 20 to 28 points ahead in the polls? I I suppose the point would be that to lead is a real privilege, but you've also got to make sure that when you're in, and I don't doubt that Keir Starmer will be the next Prime Minister, how on earth are you going to improve people's life chances? And and you you have spoken on many occasions on the issue of Brexit is just one example. The facts of Brexit are just undeniable. 
um, you know, the UK economy. <laughs> you say, well, we know that's not true. Well, <laughs> it's undeniable <laughs> for anybody yeah, yeah, that is okay, reasonably just, minded. Yeah, fair uh, And that anybody that looks objectively you read at the, the evidence. Express, have you not been following Kevin Badenoch's interventions on this, exactly. latterly? So these, you know, I mean, you just cannot be objectively minded, look at the evidence and think that Brexit has been anything other than a complete and un unmitigated disaster. And there's actually a bit of a, a consensus now, to some extent, around, you know, think tanks... Some commentators, a lot of commentators now that Brexit has been a complete disaster. But you've got a Labour Party who, yeah, as I say, uninspiring, no vision, no hope. When, it, when you're 20 to 28 points ahead, you could actually, even, even if it's just a smidgen of inspiration, a smidgen of hope, as opposed to, look, the only policy they had that differentiated themselves from the Tory party was the Green Prosperity Fund. And even that's been, well, if not completely dumped, then uh, slimmed down, to say the least. But let's, let's backtrack, because this is as much about you as it is about your politics. So let's go back to 1985, when you were born in Glasgow. Your The, the, the immigrant experience is obviously intrinsic to, to, to who you are, but not by any means the, the, the beginning and the end of, of what you are. But your dad came over with your grandparents i mm. think to, to yeah, scotland yeah. why scotland what what the, the the journey from from pakistan to scotland what was the attraction do we know do you know my so my grandfather always tells a story which kind of irked me as a as an smp or as a, as a nationalist which was so his his best friend came to the uk and came to scotland and worked in the singer sewing machine factory it was in clyde bank uh just just outside of glasgow and um he then went back to pakistan met my grandfather and said, oh, you should come to the singer, come work at the singer sewing machine factory. They're always looking for people, pays well, good work, you can get a job. And it's in, it's in Scotland. And my granddad says at that point he went to his best friend Scotland, which part of London is that? <laughs> <laughs> which rather upset and annoyed uh, me. So look, his experience, similar to many immigrants, you know, and, and a lot of immigrants then from my granddad's town then uh, and village actually, ended up in in in, in scotland um so yeah my, my, in that sense actually the immigrant story uh pretty typical and actually it's why i get really frankly pissed off if i'm being honest about the fact that we have so many in the conservative and on the right saying that multiculturalism multiculturalism has failed how can it have failed when you've got you know prime minister of uh british indian origin Sadiq Khan is the mayor of London, me is the first minister of the country, and many others that have managed to get up to, to pretty high political office that are people of colour. And uh, it's just used, I'm afraid, as a, a far-right trope, if, if nothing else. We're including some of the people that you and I would hold up as examples of its success. People yeah, sure from an ethnic minority background will claim that it has failed or that... Or that Make any it's sense? Gone wrong? Yeah, Does it not? No, complete cognitive dissonance. Are you, I, I'm, I'm wary of reading too much into that as a white bloke. I'm wary of 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 talking about drawbridges being pulled up. Do you, do you have a better understanding of it? If you wanted to get ahead in the Tory party, no, no. Look, I, I, I actually agree with that. You, you have a you have a choice as a person of color. You can either reach out your hand and pull other other people up with you, or you can pull the ladder up uh, behind you. And I'm afraid uh, there's too many. I think and uh, the right and 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 the conservative party that are happy to pull up uh, ladder uh, behind them but uh, I think those in the Conservative Party who have often said multiculturalism, is fa multiculturalism has, fa have, has failed are the exact people who've held high office and to me as I say there's that kind of cognitive dissonance um, so uh, and that's really the worry about the general election I have to say there's lots of worries I've got about the general election but one of them has to be that complete race to the bottom on so many issues and I think if we take the last few weeks you know, whether it's Lee Anderson's comments on Sadiq Khan, whether it's Suella Braverman's comments about uh, Islamists who have taken over the country and the government, uh, it's clear to me that those conspiracy theories, uh, innuendos, insinuations of Islamophobia that you would see in the underbelly of Twitter or X mm. as it is now, is now becoming mainstream in our political discourse and our media discourse. And the Conservatives are only going to ramp that up between now and a general election, complete Scottish death policy that will do huge amounts of damage. I would say not just for years to come, but potentially even generations to come. And yeah, oddly, I suppose it's one of those areas where there would be clear blue water between them and Labour. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But it's as I say, a complete Scottish death policy. Do you do you do you personally does it? Do you note it personally? Do you notice a change in the weather for you personally as a as a Muslim politician when the rhetoric changes? It not when it moves from the sewers of social media into the mainstream, when you have a former deputy chairman of the Tory party or a former home secretary going to places where 
as a phone-in host, I, I would have balked at a caller going to 10 years ago. Yeah, exactly that. So you, I've noticed it. Look, I've, for most of my political life, and I've been elected for, will soon be 13 years, um, I've had to deal with accusations of either being uh, sympathetic to extremism, mm. being involved in extremism, um, you know, his loyalty is elsewhere. It's not actually with the country he was born in or raised in or represents. But that's always been in the, as I say, the kind of underbelly of social media. It's been the preserve of the Tommy Robinsons of this world in the English Defence League. But it's now very much part of the mainstream discourse. And look, I, I took the telegraph to task on it over the weekend. I saw. Um, that I'll, I'll could, I did that purposely because conspiracy theories that I would never have expected to see in a, in a, in a mainstream newspaper is now very much being, being uh, as part of the media discourse. So this was the idea that you had, um, if you like, it rushed through funding for UNRWA as a consequence of your in-laws being released yeah. or, or, or able to make their way out of Gaza. Those two, two deeply troubling and worrying and, and, and uh, upsetting accusations in the Telegraph. One is that somehow, you know, uh, I ensured that UNRWA was funded so that my in-laws were able to yeah. leave Gaza, even though it was the FCDO that helped to release my, get my, get my in-laws out. And I'm grateful to the FCDO and the crisis team there for working hard to, to help to get my in-laws out of Gaza. But the second one, and the article was riddled with the word terror and terrorism and complaints mm. being made to the Met's anti-terror hotline. Again, it's just that insinuation that because you're a Muslim, you must, of course, you must be sympathetic to terror. So nobody questions Sunak, uh, the Prime Minister, giving money to UNRWA. Nobody questions other heads of state giving money to UNRWA. But when the Muslim First Minister does it, well, then he must have an ulterior motive, must he? You know, he can't surely be one of us. And it's just that questioning of your loyalty, which is, is actually deeply upsetting. It's gone the only place I call home. You know, I've yes. got a lot of affinity with Pakistan. My wife is Palestinian, so a lot of affinity with Palestine. But the only country I call home is Scotland. It's the only place I've been born, raised. It's a football team I support. It's where my kids are being raised. It's the country, of course, I have the privilege of leading at the moment. And there is this constant drip, drip from someone the right um, to just question that and question it now clearly from the Telegraph very publicly. Well, you know... Again, from a position of, 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 of privilege, I suppose, of, of not having a personal experience of the things that you're describing. It, historically, it's, it, these are tropes that would have been deployed by anti-Semites more obviously and more traditionally. The notion of a fifth column, the notion of an enemy within, the notion of split loyalties. And I, 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 I know that you've talked about September the 11th as being a seminal moment in your mm. political development. If we were sort of doing a, a sort of ladybird history book, September the 11th would probably be the point at which the spotlight shifted mm -hmm. from some more traditional targets of this kind of prejudice onto, onto British Muslims. Yeah, without a shadow of doubt. By the way, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia. You know, to two me, sides two, of the same coin. Two cheats of the same Co arse, absolutely. from where I'm sitting. Yeah, two, two, two sides of the same coin, without mm. a shadow of a doubt. And that's why in Scotland, I'm pleased, and I, I can't speak for England, but in Scotland, there's always been a good relationship between the Jewish and Muslim communities. I think the same is actually in many parts of, of England, mm. because they're recognised. But Sadiq Khan has worked very hard. In well, very hard, very well, hard, yes. and, he, and he should be congratulated uh, for that, actually. Um, and the point is, of course, they do that because, of course, we're, close to each other in faith and say that as somebody who's Muslim and grown up with the Jewish community for a lot of my life. But we do it also because we face the exact same threats. The mm. threat, threat from the far right, from Tommy Robinson and his ilk, uh, are the you know, same threat that comes to the Jewish population is the same threat that comes to the Muslim population. They want to get rid of us. They want to eradicate us. They want us out of their country and they think we're a threat to their way of life. So that doesn't matter whether you're 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 Jewish or whether you're, you're Muslim. In terms of... Um, you know, 9-11, I think that's probably where for me, whenever I was the target of hatred, it was racism pre-9-11. You know, Paki, it's your colour of skin, it's a, you know, black this and that and the other, to then very evidently shifting to Islamophobia, being called a terrorist, you know, shouts of Osama at you, Osama bin Laden at you when you're in the street, uh, hijabs being pulled off the head, men's beards being, you know, tugged and pulled you know that was very evident that was virtually kind of almost overnight actually how that shift happened um again let's 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 track back what what was what was home life like in in uh in the in the 80s as much as you can remember or well, the early 90s probably 90s, before yeah. you became conscious so look I, 
you, you mentioned the word privilege when you were talking. Mm. I mean, I also have privilege, and I think it's important you recognize that privilege. And my father came as an immigrant, mother came as an immigrant, you know, children of immigrants came here. You know, my mum came here when she was about, I think she was about eight, 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 nine years old. Dad was a bit older when he came here, 12, 13 years old. Didn't have an easy life. Dad's mother died when she was young. Father got remarried. Dad had to leave home quite quite young, mm. um, take care of his brothers and sisters as well. Mum. Uh, Is that because know, he didn't get on with his stepmother? Or? Yeah, essentially there was there was there was challenges. Dad, you know, my, my, my late grandfather, um, you know, just decided that they're old enough to take care of themselves, okay. and you know, and uh, you know, he was going to have kids with his new wife, and and so they moved out. And then my dad basically helped to raise some of his siblings. Uh, Mum, uh, less challenges, but still, you know, as an immigrant, new to the country, still challenges. But they, you know, again, typical immigrant story. Dad went to, it, grandfather worked in, uh, got, a, got a shop after the Singer Sewing Machine Factory, um, got a shop. Dad went to university, worked unbelievably hard, still does at 71 years old. Mm -hmm. And dad, if you're listening to this, please retire. <laughs> keep telling you to. Um, but 71, still works. Um, and gave us everything we wanted in life. And I was really lucky and had privilege. You know, he sent us to private school. Look at that, something I would do for my kids. In fact, my kids don't go to private school, they go to, to state school. But really grateful for the opportunities that dad gave us. But I do remember, um, for me, growing up, a couple of things. One, my dad, he was clearly a black sheep politically <laughs> growing up because he would get abuse for the fact that he was an SNP supporter. And, and this and is a member fascinating. Of the Asian Where did community. that come from? So, when you were an Asian migrant in particular, you always voted Labour. Mm. That was it. It was a dumb thing. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. Labour was the party of the immigrant. And the SNP, very unfairly, was being equated with the kind of far right. Mm. You know, they were saying, look, once they get their independence, they'll chuck you out. But dad just believed. Uh, that Scotland should be an independent. In fact, my dad says that he was surprised, shocked, in fact, the day he was told Scotland wasn't an independent country. Once he realised they're part of the UK, he was like, what? <laughs> what on earth? It's <laughs> dreadful. Why? Uh, and so he joined the SNP quite young uh, in the 1970s. Uh, and mum was a Labour supporter, staunch, staunch Labour supporter. And you'd have this, you know, 1997 election, which is one of the earliest memories I have of, of, of an election, um, was a... Uh, dad's SNP poster in the top window and mum's Labour poster in the downstairs and going, like, are you guys getting divorced? <laughs> and they're like, no, we just support different political parties. Um, so look, life, I was lucky, I was really uh, privileged, but mum in particular, and again, one of the more probably seminal, you may talk about a Ladybird book, one of the seminal moments for me was, you know, a, a case, actually a court case for my mum, where she wanted to view a house in the suburbs, just outside of Glasgow. And she kept trying to view this house and told there's no appointments available. The owner's away on holiday. And so my dad's white secretary then phones up and gets an appointment like this wow. overnight. And so they told you this story, did they? Well, not only told us that. My mum decided to sue the estate and take them to court and eventually won. And to us, that was amazing. We were going, you know, why did you do that? Because the abuse we got, the this is before social media, of course, but the letters we got through the door, hate-filled, uh, hate mail, literally hate mail that was pushed through the door. Uh, the stuff that you know, I got at school for it. But Mama said, "This is you know, we do we do not take this lying down." And uh, it was my mum actually that was the real kind of. Uh, How old were you when that happened? Was it? So that would have been that would have been, I think, about nine, ten. Gosh, that would have taken place so young. A little bit confused, were you by by why? I mean, the the, the justice of the cause notwithstanding, what why you would why your mum would paint a target on herself in that way no no i, I because mum was so strong robust forthright about it we're like yeah go mum they should absolutely be doing this you know you, you, there's no way that we should be treated any differently just because of who we are and who our color, what so, our color so it sounds comes. like quite a political home then yeah yeah political even though dad was not you know he, he, he was in the SNP and he would take us out leafleting he was never one to say you've got to join political party or get involved in politics but look anybody that you've ever had or spoken to that's been from the subcontinent uh, and the heritage from the subcontinent they'll tell you, you know, any family gathering quickly descends into politics <laughs> so we've been been quite political i think as a as a people how, how, how many siblings have you got two older sister and younger sister and uh, where do they sit politically if, if that's not uh, no, that's fine I've, I've, it's fine no look they would uh 
you know, similar to me, I mean, the SNP supporters. I think they're, le- they're so less. So your mum lost this battle then. Oh, uh, and, and and like after the Iraq War, it was done for her. Right. You know, she she was a big Fair fan enough. of John Smith. Yes. Um, well, and then when John Smith, and, and then yeah, and I, uh, me too actually. I quoted him in my speech mm. when I first became first minister. Actually, I remember. But um, Iraq War was was it done for her? She didn't trust Tony Blair when he first came in, and then after Iraq War, she was done. So you know, staunchly SNP. So my sister, so so is the family. Um, like ultimately. It's one of these things where there's sometimes, how dare I say it, if you don't mind me saying so, sometimes there's an, a feeling amongst the, the kind of London media that after the independence referendum, or during the independence referendum, there was what we call in Scotland the kind of stair he drama between families, lots of back and forth and fighting across the dinner, dinner, ta- dinner uh, dining table. It's actually, I think about my core group of close friends, the kind of same six friends that I've had for some of them 30 years. I've not managed to convince all of them about independence either. And I think that's it. And that I'm hoping um, that despite everything I've said about the kind of race to the bottom of politics that we see, actually there still is a space to have a bit of a mature disagreement around some of the big issues of the day, independence included. The stakes are very high though, aren't they, on independence? You might have a, a, a disagreement, but if, if, if it comes to pass, then the people who disagree with you about it will feel a very profound sense of loss. Why, why, why won't you? So, I, look, I, I agree with that, but I think it's your approach. I think it's absolutely your approach. So let's take Brexit as, and I, and I think the two are, are different, but let's take Brexit as the example. Um, what should have happened, especially when a result was so close to that, um, was that there should have been a Team UK approach, which should have taken people who were on the Remain side, as well as those who are on the Leave side, and created this kind of negotiating team they didn't push for the hardest possible Brexit, mm. given a particular result, but pushed, you know, all said, okay, you may have agreed or disagreed with the result. We've now got to work in the UK's best interest. Which now, also closes down the second referendum cause in a way, doesn't it? Because those people would have felt that they were in the room where it happened. They're, they're, they're part of it. Mm. Now, for me, once Scotland wins the next referendum on independence, I've got no doubt we will, given what polling tells us, then I think the job of those who win independence is say, right, Team Scotland, whether you're no, whether you're yes, we now get people from all different sides together. We're part of that Team Scotland approach and we go negotiate with the UK in the best interest of the country. I think that's the approach is as important actually as what you do post the result. So, I mean, apart from independence, what would be the political talking points around the dinner table when you were growing up? What would be the issues that uh, animated the, the whole family? So, mum in particular, and dad to to an extent, but mum in particular was strongly pushing us towards helping those who were the poorest and and injustice everywhere and anywhere. And that's not a generic yeah. uh, point that I'm trying to make. I suppose if I could if I could give it some colour, um, mum to this day, <laughs> um, we have a running joke in our family. Every time there's the Eid celebration, for example, I'm certain it will be the same post Ramadan we'd usually, we usually go to my mum's house for the, the meal and there's always two or three frankly random people that we've never met before <laughs> who join us and we don't mind but we're wondering where did you pick these people like where do you and, and what mum does is usually there they are people that she's come across who don't have family Right. So there'll be people who uh, maybe just uh, embraced Islam as a religion that year, so their family's not not Muslim, so they've got nowhere to go. Last year it was um, a young Palestinian student who her neighbour had befriended and said, oh, by the way, uh, to my mum, you know, Mrs. Yusuf, uh, do you mind if he comes? I was like, not at all. You know, he's not got family, he's welcome. To, to 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 lots of other you know people that she picks up, and I think that from for the in the dining across the dining room table when we we're younger, mum would always say, if you see something wrong, you speak up about it, or you do something about it. And the 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 lowest form of 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 uh, the lowest uh, thing you can do actually is just feel bad about it, mm. but absolutely speak up about it or or do something about it. And that's why I think that seminal moment with the court case was so important to me and my sisters. Um, so public service was like in the blood, um, part of what we do, part of our DNA. So if I take my two sisters as an example, my younger sister trained as a lawyer, but decided now to go into activism with a, a group that supports Muslim women through domestic abuse and other things. My older sister though, trained as a pharmacist and practiced as a pharmacist for many years, then retrained to do counselling because she wants to get she saw particularly a need within, not exclusively, but particularly a need within the in the, in the ethnic minority communities, 
particularly around men who don't speak up, don't speak out, don't talk about their mental well-being. And we all know the suicide rates among yes. uh, men more generally. So I think that was instilled with us largely down to my mum. That's not to take away from my dad, who was the party political figure in the house. But from my mum, that kind of sense of wherever you see wrong, you've got to, you've got to um, do something about it. There was a lot of love in the house as well. Oh, a huge amount. Still is to this, mm. this very day. I am really lucky and blessed to have both my parents still around, still mobile. Um, and you know, I'm lucky to be enveloped by love, actually, by by my sisters as well. Uh, to a point, I mean, my sister sent me a really <laughs> uh, horrible, uh, I'm going to call it out, she sent me this horrible uh, message, uh, which was a video that said, if you haven't spoken to your siblings today to tell them that, they've been, that they're either ugly or adopted, then here's your opportunity. <laughs> so, uh, but then lo- lots of love other than that. Other than my big sister that sending me uh, terrible memes like that. So, what do you remember of going to school? You went to a Catholic primary school, I think, but not not presumably. No, 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 just a state. You need to, you need to correct your Wikipedia. State school. <laughs> Is that right? No, no, <laughs> state, state school, men's, men's primary, uh, and they went to, as I said, private school. Mm. Look, I, I, high school, I didn't enjoy. If I'm honest, it Did was you know, a private like, we school. Jumped, we jumped ahead. What, what, what about primary school? Was that a happy time? Look, for the most part, it was. Right. For the most part, primary school was. Um, were you, enough, were you good? Were you good at your class? Were you good at lessons? Look at primary school. I don't really remember. If I'm being honest with you, James, uh, I can't go that far back uh, to if I was good at my ABCs and so on. But um, no, I enjoy uh, primary school. I enjoyed because you know, there was a lot more play involved, sure. a lot more fun involved in primary school. First time I ever came across racism was in primary school. Was it? Yeah, just um, you know, primary three, I think it was. It was just. Um, my best friend at the time decided he's not going to play with me because I was brown. And that, and that was it. Oh. First time I ever came across the P word as well. Oh. The word packy in primary school. So you kind of become aware of your race. I remember not being aware of it before then mm. and then got my mum. I didn't realise we were different. She's like, oh, yeah, different. <laughs> um, Sit down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think it really upset her. Actually, I remember of her being quite did. upset of course and thinking, oh gosh, at that young age. But generally, no, primary school no. Was, was a happy experience. High school, I have to say, I didn't, didn't enjoy it as much. Why not? I think the private school in particular, it felt like I didn't belong. There was a lot of people, you know, and, and look, dad worked hard, middle class, mm. lived in the suburbs. There was people of a different order of wealth. So we're talking us. snobbery as much as anything Yeah, else. and I'm afraid a lot of racism. A lot of racism I, I, I faced. Uh, Hard to separate the two sometimes, class and race. Yes, of course. They're bedfellows, aren't they? Yeah, of course. And I would end up getting myself in trouble because I would literally fight back. Right. You know, and, and yeah, I remember there was a time in the school bus and being told that, you know, the back seats were only for... For for white kids and really yeah, which is actually kind of they the reverse of Rosa Parks but in the <laughs> front of the bus. But you know, I was told, you know, um, you know, you sit, you know, you don't get to sit at the back of the seat, and then just started a start a fight, and uh, it wasn't great, and you should never use your hands. But you know, I was yeah, I didn't enjoy high school. I would say, and yeah, didn't didn't felt understood actually. And I remember, um, the Iraq War, uh, of course, two thousand and three. And, uh, and it, there was a protest going out. Protest, Your final year at school. Final year at school, yeah. yeah. That, that protest going on. And they were saying to school kids, you should you know, walk out and meet us at the protest. So I, I did. And then um, being threatened with suspension <laughs> from the school. But we just did it anyway. And and it was fine in the end, but my dad had to literally go into the school and say to them, well, you know, if you kick him out, then we're going to take, you know, that's us. We're going to kick up a hell of a stink about it. And here's some of our previous hits. Aha, uh-huh, you know? indeed, indeed, indeed. But also, you know, that's 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 fee for your school and, and all the rest yes, of it. Of but no, so I, look, I didn't, I didn't truthfully enjoy high school. If I'm honest, a lot of people don't. I suppose you must have uh, found true. you must have found some sort of islands of of, of happiness. Some of my friends that I made then, uh, a couple of them I still keep in touch with. Some kind of good friendships. And look, I go back to the school. I go back to sure. try to. Well, they must be very proud of speak. you. Yeah, well, I think they are, and, and not just me. I mean, the the leader. Anna Sawa was a few years uh, above you. Wasn't leader, it? leader of the opposition. Yeah. Uh, well, not leader of the opposition of, of one of the opposition Scottish parties. Labour leader. Yeah. yeah, he's he went to the same school, and as you rightly denote, he's older than me and, <laughs> uh, by a couple of years. So you know, we we'll go back on occasion, speak to the students there. Um, but yeah, no, it wasn't. It wasn't my favourite time of. If I met you then, I'd say your GCSE year, and I'd said, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" What would you have said? First of all, I would have said to you, GCSEs, how old are you, James O'Brien? And uh, I would have said it's called, uh, well, it was, in my times, it was standard grade. Yours was, it's now yes. moved. It's now moved on uh, since then as well. Um, a lawyer or journalist, believe it or not, is yeah. where uh, I wanted to be. I was decent enough at English, n- not great at sciences. Um, so thought, and, and of course, when you are, 
young South Asian. You were going to be a doctor, dentist, journalist. Uh, sorry, doctor, dentist, accountant, pharmacist, or lawyer. So I thought lawyer. Mm. And then nine eleven happened, and everything turned on its head. And I began to watch the ten o'clock news with my dad. Got interested in politics. I remember it was the scariest conversation I had with my parents when I mean, you had the uh, the UCAS form, you had the, the options for university and law, 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 and I snuck in politics at the bottom. Did you? And I got into law and politics and I had to make this choice and I wanted to study politics because I was engrossed in it by that point. And uh, speaking to my parents about not being a lawyer, and uh, but they were great about it. Dad more so. Mum was more probably, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Um, it's it's dad, harder dad to see the road ahead, it. isn't it, I suppose? Oh, totally. Career-wise, it's... Oh, totally. My mum, mum said, look, it's ultimately your choice. But kind of what kind of job... You get that a lot. Kind of what, what job would you end up getting if you study politics? T t tell me a bit more about that. It's not... Cause, I mean, it's both immediately obvious why someone who, who, who had lived the life you'd lived would be sent completely off on a new course by the events of September the 11th. But it's not necessarily obvious why you would then want to make a study of politics mm. and not, I don't know, for example, extremism or religion or, or, yeah. or something else. Why politics? You, you referenced, or we talked earlier on about how inherently political my family was. Mm. And it was all, and I, I mentioned the fact my mum always said, look, if you want to change something, we'll change it. And you see something wrong, go do something about it. And to me, politics, the study of politics, not that I always wanted to be uh, a frontline politician, far from it, actually. I, I was decent, as I said to you, kind of English. And um, I always thought of myself as maybe somebody doing some research or writing speeches, a little bit more in the background. And I thought, well, that's a good way to influence things. And uh, as I say, I had an interest in it. And dad always said to me, he always said, whatever you study makes you passionate about it and you love it because then doors will open for you. Mm. Like whatever you choose, doesn't matter what it is. As long as you genuinely, your heart's in it, don't do something you're being forced into, son. Do something that you're you're going to love because then you'll just, your opportunity will open. And he was dead right about it. So no, to me, politics was the obvious place to go. So it wasn't then an academic interest in politics. It was seeing politics as an apprenticeship for action. Yeah, absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt. That's it. I mean, quite young. I, I mean, you know, the the... The events notwithstanding it's quite a young age to be thinking i want to actually be influencing events i want to be but we had to we were, we were being you know as, as a muslim community we we're being battered and buffeted by events right and and we were being told what our religion our faith and our identity actually what it was by people who had no idea about it so we were being told that islam meant this and muslims believed in this and that their loyalties were split they were they couldn't be british and muslim they couldn't be scottish and pakistani they had there was all this going on and we were being buffeted completely from left to right all over the place. And there was a, I remember actually, it was a really, again, kind of talking about seminal moments. It was a meeting mm. that happened shortly after 9-11. And it was mainly the elders of our community. It was all men. It was the elders of the community that kind of arranged a, a meeting in a, in a, in a, in a community center. And they invited me as the youngest guy there, but they knew I was pretty gobby, right? And they knew I'd spoken out about things and had a bit of a voice. And they invited me. And there was a huge generational split in that room. And, you know, this is not to disrespect my elders. I love them, of course, to bits. But the elders wanted to keep our head down and say, look, the Muslim community, just keep your head down. This law will blow over. It'll be fine. And we'll get back to doing what we do. Um, and then there was a, the younger generation of which I was, of course, a part of at the time which was saying, oh, this is a massive opportunity for us, you know, the Muslim community, to say who we are, what our faith actually stands for, what we represent, as opposed to letting other people tell our story for us. And, you know, a lot of us identified, well, we don't have enough Muslims in journalism and politics and so many other uh, fields, as opposed to the traditional fields where we'd often, we'd often uh, been, at times, even over, over, over-represented, mm. actually. So, uh, you know, for me, that, there was... There was that in the in the back of my mind. I'd had no idea, of course, what it would end up leading to, but I am now. But um, yeah, no, it was for me. There was almost no choice but to, to study politics. I haven't had much inkling yet of ambition in in the sort of simplest yeah. sense of the word. Have you Have you dreaming of being something or someone? No, because to be honest, that's not the reason why I got into politics. I genuinely thought I'd come in in the background, and I was. I was a researcher for a while. I was, you know, a parliamentary researcher. I worked a little bit for Nicola, a bit for Alec mm. at the time. And jumped around quite a lot. That presumably was normal in the context yeah. of the party. Yeah, p partly like the circumstances. Unfortunately, the, the the person I did work for died midway through term. Bashir, Bashir Ahmed, a great mm. influence of mine. And the party was really keen not to lose me. So they must have seen something half decent in me. So they said, "What do you think that can... was?" Do you know, I, I think um, 
I suppose others could probably answer for that, but I think there were so few people of colour in politics, um, so few that had the interest that I did. And they must have, I mean, the credit to Nicola and Alex, they must have seen something in me that said, well, well look, this guy can be in front like politics in our parliament. Yeah, what do you think? It needs was? more people of colour. I don't truthfully know. It would be for them, I suppose, to, to say. You're allowed uh, to have an idea. You're allowed to have a theory. <laughs> look, I uh, was loyal to the party, the cause. I believed in it. Um, I could speak well. Mm. And when did you discover that? You mentioned having a reputation for gobbiness with, with, with the elders, but all, all you've mentioned so far was, was going on a march. So yeah. where, where, where did the, where did the, and, and let's not say gobbiness, let's, let's be a bit more generous. Let's say oratorical skills. When, when did, when did you discover that you possessed them? First ever speech I did of any note, believe it or not, this is going to sound bizarre. <laughs> My mum was part of the interfaith group in Glasgow. And it was a Church of the Latter Day Saints that asked for a young Muslim to come and speak um, about their faith. And my mum said, "Oh yeah, my son will come and speak." And mum put me up this with a week's notice, and I'd never done a speech before in my life. And I got one heck of a rousing response. Did you? Yeah, but you know, people coming up to me at the end and say, that, you know, "Best speech we've heard," and brilliant speech. And then I thought, "Oh, God, I'm not too bad at this." And then I did a few and. It was, to be honest, where I really found my voice, so that was the first speech I ever did, but where I really found my voice was in the, the anti-war movement. You know, I, I opposed uh, Iraq in particular, but Afghanistan as well, actually, mm. uh, as it became evident, the civilian toll it was taking, uh, but, but, but Iraq in particular, and so I did a fair number of stump speeches as part of the anti-war movement, including here in London as well as uh, up in Scotland. But I think it was a mixture of those those, those, those things that probably Nicola and Alex, both between them, thought hey, look, we need to, and we want to hold on to this guy as best we possibly can. And you threw yourself into into student politics as a student as well, I think, yeah, at the yeah, University yeah. of Glasgow. Was it, was it always Glasgow? Would you have been tempted to have gone elsewhere in the UK or were you definitely going to stay in Scotland? Uh, Scotland. I never applied outside of Scotland, so it was yeah. always going to be Scotland for me. And that was, as I say, it was my country, the country I got home and the one that I wanted to get involved in the politics up here. So there was not really uh, much much uh, in my head that I ever thought of, of leaving Scotland and Glasgow, my home city, mm. uh, for lots of different reasons. Partly, of course, because we do the best curry uh, <laughs> side of India and Pakistan, of course, uh, in Glasgow. So why go elsewhere? Do you um, uh, just just a quick word then on on how that happens when you're growing up? How, how that because you mentioned frequently the, the the simplicity of your relationship with your Scottishness, but of course, for an awful lot of Scottish people, they've ended up in a very different place where they have a true duality. So Ooh. what what was it about home life that made it that straightforward for you? Was it just the way your parents spoke about Scottishness or the way? Yeah, look, for me, actually, a few things. First of all, there's actually a really good study on this, quite old study now, but it's uh, oxymoronic nationalism. It's a Glasgow, couple of Glasgow researchers did Professor Bill Miller, I think it was, and, and, and Asif Hussain. But a good, good study actually is worth looking at why, for example, are Scottish people and Scottish Muslims and Scottish Pakistanis more comfortable describing themselves as Scottish than, for example, English Muslims calling themselves English or British? And, you know, they go into lots of different reasons and academic uh, research into why that's the case. And essentially, actually, What's been good about, I think, the Scottish identity is that it's a very civic nationalism. Nationalism can have quite dirty and dark oh, connotations. Sure, There's no yes. doubt about that. Whereas actually what we've tried to promote is a civic nationalism over the years, which says it doesn't really matter where you're from. What matters is if you count Scotland as your home, then it's your home and we should go forward together. And I, I, I very rarely, I, was not, I would not say never, but very, very rarely got questioned about post 9 11, are you Scottish or are you Muslim? They're kind of just generally broadly accepted that you can be, because Scotland was what was termed by, by Willie McIlvanny, the author, you know, as a mongrel nation, mm. come from all over the place. Yeah, but so, so is the rest of the UK. I wonder why Scotland has taken that status to heart more. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe part of it the is. The Irish possibly, but. But look, maybe part of it is because for a long time, for example, the, the British flag, or certainly the St. George's Cross, yeah. the English flag was appropriated by 
the far right. No, I think it's changed a lot massively. Yeah, sure. Actually, I actually think there's a bit of credit there for the, the English football team. You know, it's re- massively racially diverse yes. football team, far more than, 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 than other football teams. Um, and I, and I think they've, they've managed to take that flag back and, 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 uh, you know, I think people are more comfortable now calling themselves English or British than perhaps they were previously. So I think in Scotland, we've had that civic nationalism. That's something we've promoted as a party I've been proud of. And I'll, 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 Take the issue of immigration, which is one that comes up in your programme regularly, and you'll see how fierce a debate can be. By and large, if I take Scottish politics and think about devolution and the Scottish Parliament, by and large, there is very little negativity about migration in Scotland Mm. from the political discourse. Even the Scottish Conservatives are generally in the whole more positive about migration and the need for migration in Scotland. Not wholly, but generally more supportive. So I think there's there's a, there's maybe a, a difference in terms of uh, those kind of debates, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should be at all complacent. I'm fascinated by the, the, the contrast that you represent between the, the criticism of people for being political animals all their life, like never had a quotes proper job, end quotes. But under your analysis, there is no more proper job than politics. So to go straight from graduating essentially into the party machine was a, a mark of your desire to actually start making changes. It's odd. I've never thought of that before. The, the, there's, just, the, the, there's something a bit silly about saying, why why would you want to go straight into politics? Why wouldn't you want to go off and be a chartered surveyor for 10 years or write a newspaper column or something like that? Yeah, I never, I never got it, honestly. No, I I've, never, never, I've only just seen it like this today. I never got that argument because no, look, for a few really. reasons. First of all, you should never have a parliament that's not got people, I think, in their 20s or 30s yeah. represented, right? Because else, how else will the body politic understand what 20 and 30-year-olds want, need, desire, what their views are? But secondly, and I've been around politics for quite a while, just because you were a used car salesman for 15 years <laughs> or whatever job you had. I don't know, you could have been a brain surgeon. I mean, that's, that's, that's not, be, but yeah. actually, you know, we, we do have a couple of used car salesmen in the Scottish <laughs> Parliament and, and they've got a contribution to make for sure. But just because you've done that job doesn't mean that you know everything about, for example, how the National Health Service should be run or how the no, justice system or the prison course. system should be run. And actually the same as if you are a brain surgeon, I mean, it's a great example. If you're a brain surgeon, and we've got a couple of doctors or Mm. Least, well, we've had a couple of doctors. We've got one doctor in the Scottish Parliament as things stand. And um, just because you're a brain surgeon and you'll know everything about brain surgery and quite a lot about the NHS, which is great, doesn't mean, first of all, that you know everything about health and social care. Actually, uh, but it also doesn't mean you'll know everything about education, transport, justice. So the point of being a minister, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with having lots of experience in various different professions, but ultimately the job of a minister and ultimately job of the first minister and prime minister it's got to be to take advice from the experts and that's become a dirty word in mm. recent years but you've got to be able to take advice from the experts and then apply your judgment and make a decision on what the best way and the best course forward is and that doesn't really matter if you're really as i say a brain surgeon or, or you're a used talking car salesman. about politics as a profession yes which has become quite unfashionable in recent years for, for, for reasons i mean but as i say i've never understood it I oh, thought, I thought clearly we wouldn't you know, we wouldn't say to somebody, you know, well, actually, we wouldn't dismiss anybody in any other profession having studied that profession before going into it. No, we wouldn't. But for politicians, you say, well, they just studied politics, they're just political apparatchik, climbing up the greasy pole, all the stuff I've had, you know, for, yes. for my whole time in politics. So it seems very unique to, 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 to politics. And I suppose looking at your career through that lens, the speed with which you accelerated, it makes, 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 sense i mean it makes perfect sense but it was notably quick so you're out of university in 2007 and by 2011 you're the youngest at the time the youngest msp to enter hollywood so when did the shift come from thinking i'll be fine in the background writing speeches to thinking no actually i'd, I'd rather be a little more front and center than that it must have happened quite quickly when, was it when, when your mentor and so and, a bit man- mentor late bashir ahmed yeah uh, he was the first ever person of colour to be elected to the parliament. He's a wonderful man. I knew him as a family friend, actually, mm. um, for, for my whole life. And one of those people in life that you don't realise you're being taught, but you're being taught, and, and until they're gone, I'm afraid, then you just realise how much you learned from that individual. Mm. But the moment he died, actually, it was his son who invited me to his house 
And he said, Hamza, you've got to stand. And I said, well, what about you? What about your family? And he said, you know, I'm not in politics. I don't believe in nepotism. I don't believe it's for, for me to stand next time around just because I'm Bashir's son. We want you to do it. You were close to my dad. You've got the political skills. You understand politics. You've done the apprenticeship. You should do it. And, you know, he wasn't the only one, but he was the first one. And he literally said that to me days after his dad died, days after the funeral. It was a couple of days after the funeral, actually. Cool. Um, he sat me down and then he kept saying it and kept saying it and kept saying it. And he wasn't the only one. I mean, Nicola and Alex and others <clears throat> um, wanted me to do it. And, and I was still up in the air. But then, you know, it was going back to what my mum always said to us. If you want to make change, then you got to do it. And if not you, then, then who? And if not now, then when? So, and so you told your parents, presumably, fairly early in the process. Yeah, yeah. And, and dad, hugely supportive. Mum, and she's like this to this day. Um, just full of worry and stress about head above the parapet stuff. Yeah, totally. You make yourself a target. Yes. In fact, I'll read you a message that uh, here's a message that I got. <laughs> I don't. I don't tend to do all of my own social media or check it very often. Sure. But I got um, somebody replied to my Ramadan Ramadan message, and a local restaurant, a steak restaurant. Yeah. Replied and said, your mum was in our restaurant yesterday. I asked her how she was, and she replied, I'm fine, except for the stress that my son brings, laughing emoji. <laughs> so <laughs> that has been my mum to, to, since the day I told her I was going to go into politics. Was She was always worried about this, the, the fact that you'd have a target in your back, you know, almost quite literally. Yes. Uh, have a target in your back that you become under threat. And she feels it now more so with the family. Course. With the kids, with the wife, and yet she was fearless herself when you Completely. were growing up, and it? she doesn't care about you know her, her and my dad getting abuse. Not right. that they do, but she doesn't sure. care about that. She's always worried about you, son, and your kids, and Nadia. And she was like that when I was weighing up whether to go first minister. And you've literally James got what two days to make a decision. You know, Nicola, Nicola resigns on the Wednesday. If you're going to launch your campaign, you basically got to launch on the weekend. You got a few days, a couple of days, a few days. And and what I did was me and my wife basically went to a you know, bunker. She and I obviously discussed it. And then we spoke to my mum and dad, my sisters. That was really the only people, one or two others, but sure. largely the only people that we spoke to. And mum was, you know, dad was just, you have to go for it. It's no ifs or buts, son. You know, you've worked this hard. You've done this many jobs, the tough jobs, health secretary, transport. You know, why would you not? Mum was much more reticent. She was like, you know, there's a different level of exposure for you and the kids and you know it's it's not a nice world to be out in but it is the only world you know yeah for and and, and actually why would you not i mean well that's the question i think you said it, yeah, especially if you thought you'd be the best person for the job which you did best clearly. person for the job worked over the years done different roles done the tough jobs got the experience not got everything right by any stretch of the imagination but yeah best person but also i think ultimately my wife said to me comes if you didn't do it and you watch that election contest mm. how would you feel Oh, yeah. It's a bit of a clincher. That was it. Were you as blindsided by Nicola Sturgeon's departure as everybody else was? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I always thought she would step down before a general election. Right. But this, always, this year's general election. Sorry, not before. Forgive me. Before a Scottish election. Right. I always thought so it would be after years. the general election. Yeah. Okay. So I always thought it would be after a general election. That would give then her her. So you were, you would have things. been thinking about having a swing at it. People would, people ask me all would yeah. ask me all the time. First day of an interview I did, people would say, Well, if Nicola was to stand in tomorrow, would, would you, you throw your hat into the ring? Would you go for it? Okay. And you just tell them you just tell them no, <laughs> to be honest. Um and, and you won. <laughs> I yeah. hope that's not a spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but not perhaps by as much as you would have expected. Uh, but actually I put it differently. I mean, I went into that race at one point third yes. favourite. I mean But you were there you was were a very, the, the choice of the Essentially, the choice of the party um, I establishment. Argue, I would argue that. I mean, would you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the received narrative, isn't it? It yeah. is the received narrative. Look, Nicola never to her Jews. I mean, she got asked every day after she stood down, also after she announced standing yeah. uh, her departure. She got asked every day who she would support, and she was complimentary of of Kate and I. We were the two ended up being the two front runners. Um, so no, I don't. I don't view that uh, yeah. at all. But what I would say is. Um, you mentioned that kind of not, you know, you, you didn't win perhaps as much as you thought you would. 
Lukai wasn't. I, I thought Kate and and the, the person that didn't go for it, Angus Robertson, who's now one of my cabinet ministers. You know, those two were were seen as the bookies as yes. being the two favourites, and I was seen as a bit of an outsider for for different reasons. Um, so it was, but I really enjoyed the campaign. I have to say, it was. Um, you know, being health secretary is always a tough job, uh, particularly in the midst of a pandemic. Being able to talk about health plus other issues actually was 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 great during that campaign. I love campaigns. I mean, a lot of politicians that can't stand them, I love them. For me, being with people gives me, it's like a plasma, it gives me energy. Um, and that's why I, even as first minister, I try to get out as much as I can. I don't like just sitting in the ministerial tower in Edinburgh and having to, you've got to read over submissions, of course, that's part and mm. parcel of the job. But as much as I can get out and talk to people, engage with people, it gives me an energy that I greatly enjoy. It's it's a bit like management though, isn't it? Is that the further, the, the further up the ladder you move, the further away from the bits that you love. Yeah. You end up. But you're in control as first minister. I okay. think that's the difference. So I can say to my team, and I do put visits in because I want to speak to people. I want to meet with people. I make sure I go to campaigning. I was chapping doors in Dundee, you know, and just doing the lethal thing and just there for a couple of hours into the local butcher and a local super, and supermarket. Just make sure that you're constantly engaging with people to me is the best part of the job. So we're sort of edging now towards towards today, towards where we are now, and and inevitably, as an interviewer, this is the point where I'll ask you a couple of questions that you've probably been asked a million times before. Most obviously, the gift of the referendum is is in the hands of the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and the the the, the confidence or the optimism you have that one of them soon, whoever it may be, will give you that gift, it, it may be misplaced. So what I've got to do, what I have to do, is acknowledge first and foremost, there's no shortcut. If yeah. there was, frankly, Nicola probably wouldn't have stood down. She may well have, because there was other factors, no doubt, uh, that she'd done it for so long. But ultimately, if there was a shortcut, if there's a way of bypassing that Westminster block that exists, then I would do it in a second. But there isn't. You're absolutely right to say that there's, and I'm putting words in your mouth, there's an intransigence mm. from Westminster that says, doesn't matter what you say, what you do, we're going to keep saying no. Or an ideological commitment to the union. If, if, if. But even, even, even if you have that ideological commitment to the union, then put that to the people and let the people Fair. demonstrate their verdict. Yes. Um, which is, in fairness, what David Cameron did, completely mm. diametrically opposed to us on the issue of the constitution, but respected the mandate. What I've got to do is make sure that I create the political conditions by which we get that second referendum. In the same way that we got the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Parliament didn't come about because the Labour Party just thought, oh, this should be a great idea to put this in our manifesto. Why don't we do it? We just pluck it out of thin air. No, the discussion and the debate around Scottish a Scottish Parliament, Scottish devolution had been brewing for many years. And then the political support for it meant that it was unstoppable. And actually a, pl a party would have been destroyed if the Labour Party hadn't would have been finished in Scotland yeah. if they hadn't put that in the manifesto and committed to it as they did, in fairness to them, in ninety seven and the 97 Manifesto. So we've also got to, from a Scot the SNP's perspective, and let's be frank about it, Brexit, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, that hasn't shifted the dial on independence in the way that we require it to. It's definitely edged it in the right direction. Polls puts it 50, above 50%. What we have to have is consistency, uh, majority, a consistent majority. And what we've got to do is not just talk about why Westminster rule is terrible, which you know, I can speak for hours on. But actually, why are we telling people to vote for independence? What are we asking them to vote for? And that's where we're trying to shift some of that, that narrative and create the political conditions for another referendum. How, how threatened are you by stability and competence in Westminster? Well, again, I suppose that goes to my very point. My very point is that we can't just talk about where Westminster's failing because there's inevitably come points where there will be stability. Mm. I don't know. Can you get more? Oh, I should be careful. Fingers what crossed. I, I should be careful <laughs> what I say here because <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, can you get any more unstable than, yeah. than currently you have? We that, said that about that, Boris Johnson. Yeah, but possibly you can. Yes. Um, but my, my, my point with Keir Starmer is that I think you know he'll he'll manage the decline of the UK, but he'll do it more competently. I think it's hard. To be as incompetent as the Conservative government currently are. But we've got to get away from just the arguments against Westminster rule and the arguments for why independence. Mm. But what is the argument? How how am I better off as an independent? It's the difference between a positive and a negative vote. Yes, and it? I think and I think you, you know, we have now made the argument it's comprehensive and we've had, we've not even had to make the argument comprehensively. It's self evident that Westminster is in complete chaos and turmoil. Um but we've got to say to people, well look, the alternative is much better. How, how 
it's the word I want. Not invested, because that's a silly question. But how how angry were you with the with the with the speaker's decision a couple of weeks ago to take the Labour amendment rather than the SNP motion? You know, I was I was just more angry about it and annoyed and frustrated because not not because the Labour motion got taken. Like it is a source of political frustration, but you know the SNP, you know, the opposition, the debate, a yeah. motion should be heard. You know, but that that actually wasn't the source of frustration. The source of frustration was the next day when I'm being doorstepped and being asked to do lots of media interviews. They're not asking me about the situation in Gaza. They're asking me about whether or not the speaker's position is tenable or not. You know, which I don't think it it was or is. But you know, that is by the by. That is taking away from what is the worst humanitarian catastrophe I've seen in recent times. And instead, then Westminster did what Westminster does, which is somehow make the story about completely Westminster. about Westminster yeah, and the bubble. The so that's probably what I was more, frankly, annoyed about rather than, than the actual politics of it. Well, 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 let's talk then about the, the defining issue of, of, of this time in world politics, let alone your politics or, or, or broader British politics. I presume... Your in-laws, Nadia's parents, Majid and, and Elizabeth, when they got trapped in Gaza, there was no question of trying to keep it quiet. It wasn't one of those situations that you could have kept a lid on, or, or did you have conversations about whether or not you would you know, we go didn't, public? We didn't say anything for the first couple of days. No. For, you know, we just, it's such a difficult issue to speak about publicly in the sense that, you know, my in-laws, we know Gaza was under control of Hamas. So if we, and I, and of course there was no question of me criticizing Hamas for and 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 condemning their abhorrent terror attack on October seventh, but I also knew that that could have an impact on them and their family. They could be targets. You know, we we know Hamas don't take kindly to people speaking against them, mm. and if they could get to my in-laws or get to my brother-in-law, for example, or any of the wider family, they could really be made an example of. So there was that consideration, and then there was a consideration uh, as well about um, actually. If you criticise the actions of the Israeli government, which again, to me, there was no question of doing, given the amount of civilian bodies that were piling up, continued to do to this day, then actually maybe we'll never get them out because getting them out would require, I suspect, some cooperation um, with the with the Israeli government um, through 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 the official channels. So there was always that consideration, but to be honest, after a couple of days, it was very very clear that they were trapped and they were stuck. And we had to raise their voice. And actually, it was my mother-in-law who said, you need to tell the world what's happening. Like we, um, we she was describing the devastation and destruction in the first few days um, and said the world has to know what's happening, Hamza. The world still doesn't in some ways, or, or this, this corner of the world. I'm not sure actually that's true. I, I think the world does know because you and I have seen the news reports in 24 hour news we see the social media and in fact to me that makes the horror even worse so we're watching and we've seen video we've seen video footage of yes. unarmed men with waving white flags being shot we've seen children so malnutur mal mal malnourished that they're practically skeletons and then die we've seen the footage of hospitals being hit refugee camps being hit UN schools being held. Well, we have, but I do wonder sometimes, particularly, I, I mean, I was looking at the Telegraph today and they, they report some Conservative MPs criticising David Cameron for not being unstinting in his support of the Israeli government. No. I, I, and that's, to me, entre the, that entrenched position is the problem. That actually, what we should be looking at is the undeniable mounting death toll of civilians, women and children, undeniable, given the footage that we've seen of how many thousands have been killed. You can, you can argue about whether it's this many thousand or that many thousand, but it's thousands that have been killed. Actually, it's, it's, it's probably not an argument that should get as much mileage as it gets because the, the, the detail that's provided on the death tolls is actually pretty serious. I mean, it's names, it's family connections. People say it's the Hamas-run health ministry. I've been on a crash course on some of this stuff in the last few months, so I, I'm keen to establish the provenance of these numbers, and it's a lot more reliable than the phrase Hamas-run health ministry would normally allow. Yeah, I mean, just take the evidence then from UN agencies alone. What are UN agencies tell us about the death toll? So my point is that it shouldn't be an entrenched position. The position should be one that says this many children have died 
and it has to stop. Now, I, I, I have been involved in external affairs because I used to be the Minister for External Affairs in, in the Scottish Government for a number of years, dealt with good people in the Foreign Office in the past. You know, I would name people like Alistair Burt, for example, you know, somebody I've got a tremendous amount of respect for. And what they would often say to me is, look, we'll try to pressure in the background. But there, there has to come a moment where you realise your exertions in the background are completely futile. And you've got to take a position and add to that international effort, that international pressure to get a ceasefire. And the UK government just hasn't done that. So they've had this line where they refuse to call for an immediate ceasefire, seem to frankly follow behind whatever the United States is saying. The US is always going to be a close ally of ours. That doesn't stop us from having a different position, nor should it ever do so. And we also don't seem to have any influence with the Israeli government at all. And so we're in the worst of, of, of all positions and, you know, eventually this situation will be, I would hope, resolved in the short term. There will be a ceasefire, I hope, at some point. The longer term implications of what's happened, not just for the region, but here, for the, any, the West's moral authority to talk about human rights, I think has been, if not completely uh, wiped out is severely diminished. What that, what the situation and the the duplicitous way that it's been handled by some Western governments, including our own, that will be fodder for extremists. Uh, they will use that in their scripts. You know, when it comes to propaganda, and you know it is going to have ramifications in the UK as well as, of course, the region, I think, for generations to come. And I suppose the converse of that, for those of us who want a peaceful, permanent resolution, the converse of that was encapsulated by Joe Biden this weekend when he talked about Netanyahu now damaging Israel because that generational uh, harm is, is being done to Israel standing among people elsewhere in the world. And not, not only that, look, for people like me, and I suspect you, who support a peaceful, safe, secure Israel, yes. orphaning children or killing children is not the way to do it. And I take, I've said before, if I take my own example, you know, if you, if I go out to the market to go get some supplies desperately needed for my family and kids, and I return to my house and it's been flattened, mm. and see if you've killed my wife and killed my kids, there's only one thing I've got to live for, and that's revenge. You better believe it. That's the only thing I've got to live for, is revenge. And I don't know anybody else who's different. And so if you want a safe and secure Israel, killing children or killing uh, innocent mothers and fathers, mm. grandparents, is not the way to do it. All you're going to do is perpetuate this cycle of violence that we've seen for decades, which, but even longer. Which seems crystal clear to so many, but apparently is inconceivable to others. So we've come full circle, and I, I almost hesitate to bring such a sort of unsavory character into this conversation, but he's become a, a rallying point for some of the stuff that you've described. And in the context of this, the continuing conflict, the, the price that some people want Muslims in this country to pay, being cited by Lee Anderson when he accuses Sadiq Khan of being in the in the pocket or in the control of Islamists. Just a quick word in conclusion on on the protests, on the marches. I think there were more people arrested out of 10,000 protesters in Tel Aviv on Saturday night than there were out of a reported 400,000 marches in London. And yet this narrative of these marches being anti-Semitic and full of hatred and them being... The, the, apparently the voters of Ashfield talk about nothing else about how they want to reclaim the streets of London from people. Have you been surprised by the tone and the and the speed of this rhetoric? Um, not surprised, dismayed, I suppose okay. would be the would be the word. Um, you know, is is I think un, I don't know if there's been a situation like this where the champions, so called champions of free speech, yeah, are the very ones who want to clamp down on that free speech. Because of course it doesn't agree with their or suit their narrative. Not, not that kind of free not speech. Not that kind of free speech. My free speech is absolutely <laughs> fine. And um I'm very worried. And we were speaking ahead of the UK government um publicly yes. articulating their definition of extremism as they're trailing it. And, and that whole set piece with Rishi Shunak outside of number ten. Bizarre. Not just bizarre, dangerous, I would say. Right. Because what 
a lot of us fear is going to happen is that their definition of extremism will be so wide it'll encapsulate so many organizations that are very much in the mainstream mm. so what do you do what do you do if you stop the mainstream from having a voice well, it's very evident what you do you end up pushing people to the fringes and that only worsens the problem with extremism i can only speak for scotland i've not been to any of the pro-Palestinian marches in, in London, though I, I know plenty of people, including my own parents actually, that have travelled down uh, on occasion to those marches. They're not hate-filled. In any march, protest, demonstration, you're going to get your handful of idiots. You're going to get your handful of people that will say something they absolutely shouldn't. You might even get some who will cross a line into criminality. Mm. You've got to have trust in the police to be able to deal with that. But something should be dropping for the political class and particularly the conservatives in government that if hundreds of thousands of people are taking to the streets every single week, been over 150 days now since 7th of October, but every single week, hundreds of thousands are taking to the street. You've got to try to understand why on earth they're so upset and angry. And it's not one community. I've right. seen the marches in London, Glasgow, Edinburgh. It's not just Muslims that are on those marches. People of all faiths and no faiths whatsoever who've just got basic compassion and humanity that they're crying out to be seen from the political class that is, that is so removed from the international community as it stands. So, no, I'm deeply worried, I have to say, deeply concerned about what's going to happen in relation to the UK government's uh, definition of extremism. Final question. And in many ways, it could apply to pretty much every single strand of the conversation that we've just had. And the question is, how do you stay so hopeful? <laughs> do you know, because I believe in the common decency of people, genuinely. So every time I've had a racial attack, an Islamophobic attack, the voices of good and solidarity have far outweighed the voices of bad. By a hundredfold. You know, for every idiot that has said something to me, the amount of solidarity, and even just take the Telegraph article that we, we touched upon that, you know, was full of Islamophobic insinuation and smears. The amount of messages that I got on the back of that cross party, people who were nothing to do with politics, people that would say to me, can't stand you, but support you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got a lot of those messages, a bit too many actually for my liking, but, you know, people like, you know, constantly, uh, whenever these incidents, raise their head whenever we see them surface the voices of good far outweigh the voices of bad so i have to be hopeful if i'm not hopeful then i'm fatalistic and i'm fatalistic we may as well just call call it a day shut the shop and let the frankly uh, extremists uh, have their day and whether that's political extremists or others so I, I refuse to do that i've got to remain hopeful and i've got to make sure that uh, we're articulating that hope as much as we can every day and i think people are crying out for hope People are genuinely crying out for hope. They see their, you know, conservatives, Labour, and I don't think you get much hope from either of them. So there's a huge opportunity for the SNP to articulate that hope. And uh, yeah, and that's why I'm very confident about general election, whenever it may be. Hamza Yusuf, thank you. Thank you.